It's the Queen City Music Podcast. The podcast devoted to the local music scene in Charlotte, North Carolina. Here's your host, Matthew Ablin. Hello and welcome to episode 19 of the Queen City Music Podcast. If you're a regular listener to the QCMP, you know that I speak with a variety of people who are involved with the music scene here in Charlotte. And this month, I'm happy to introduce you to the band, The Business People. They're a wonderfully talented quartet, which has a type of 80s vibe to them. The members are Nick Robinson on guitar and lead vocals, Anthony Puglis on drums, Connor Hausman on guitar, and Hyatt Morell on bass. Without a hesitation, let's get right to it. All right, I've got here the business people. I've got Nick Robinson, who's the singer and guitar player, and Anthony, who we're working on pronouncing his name. <laughs> Anthony? <laughs> my, my, name is, uh, my name is Anthony Puglis. I am the drummer, and uh, I do backing vocals with the band. Okay. All right, so are you guys originally from the Charlotte area? Nick? Uh, no, I'm actually from Richmond, Virginia. Uh, I moved down here when my dad uh, transferred at his job, and Tony was like the second person I met. Oh. And Tony, yeah. yourself? That's, uh, let's see. I, I moved here when I was a child. I was born in Dallas, um, Texas, the real, mm. the real Dallas. <laughs> I, I like to tell people. As opposed to fake Dallas? <laughs> yeah. Oh, North Carolina? Nope. We Texas. just lost every Dallas, North Carolina fan that we could have had. <sighs> yeah, I moved from Dallas when I was uh, seven or eight. Same issue. You know, dad got a better job opportunity, so we came up here. Okay. And uh, Nick was not the second person I met, but <laughs> <laughs> earliest, closest friend I could talk about, you know? Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, Nick, what's your musical background? Uh, growing up, my parents were church singers and most of my family plays some kind of instrument in a church and usually bass, drums, all that stuff. And I tried all of it and I was really bad at it. Mm -hmm. So I was like, all right, guitar, no one plays guitar. I can't be the worst at guitar in the family. <laughs> and, um, you know, besides that, I played in band all through high school, eight years, uh, three years of marching band. What instrument? Tenor saxophone. Tenor sax. Right, man. <laughs> it's good to start young, man. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Anthony, how about yourself? Oh, man. Uh, kind of ignored music until I was 12, and then I realized how much a part of my life it was. Mm -hmm. And then uh, same thing. I started actually being serious about it in middle school. Went into marching band all four years of high school. Was in the jazz band. Played with Nick a little bit. Playing drums in the, in the, in the band? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Actually, um, our our first foray into trying to have a band that was together. Yeah. In eighth really? grade. Yeah. Oh, yeah. so you guys go back a ways. Yeah. yeah. It was both of our first bands called four shots. Wow. And, and then there were what, three practices and nobody else showed up. Yep. It was just me and you playing <laughs> red hot chili peppers covers. <laughs> <laughs> and then we, then we went our separate ways for a few years and then Nick kind of reunited that. Yeah, senior year in high school, me and our old guitarist, Will, were like, yeah, we're going to enter this battle of the bands just to see, you know, about to graduate and leave. So. Right. And uh, I'd been in a band with Will in ninth grade, and so we were like, we need to get the rest of a band together. And I think I was passing Tony in the hallway or something, and he was talking to somebody, and I just like went over and I was like, hey, can you play drums or something this weekend? And he was like, uh, I guess so. <laughs> I'll text you. <laughs> It always starts slowly, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so since we're talking about the band thing and the battle of bands, how did the business people come together? How did, how did that work out for you fellas? Um, so our old guitarist, Will, and I were in a band in ninth grade together, and I was playing bass in that band. And I guess I was practicing guitar, and I started. I learned how to play Alan in the Sun by Weezer. And I Neat. played it at band practice one time and sang it. And they were like, hey, you actually aren't that bad right now. And I was like, <laughs> Oh, really? Thank you. Like, yeah. So I was like, all right, I quit. <laughs> I'm a guitarist now. And uh, so Will and I met back up at the Silver Sun pickup show. Right. And Sugar Glider opened. And uh, we were like, they're from Charlotte and they killed it. And they're with, you know, Silver Sun pickups. Maybe we can do something like this. Right. And so that led to us starting, like, you know, getting the idea for the business people. And we got up once and, like, played some songs and stuff. And that's when we realized, like, we need a full band. And mm -hmm. that's when we got Tony in and our old friend Amanda to play bass. Yeah. Then we played that Battle of the Bands. And I think we ended up getting a show the night before the Battle of the Bands and played that too. And they both went surprisingly well. Mm -hmm. and so we just kind of ran with it. Hmm. Do you remember the name of that venue? Our very first show? The Zoo Club? Club Zoo. 
club suit. That's it. Yeah. Bill Price was the owner. I remember that. <laughs> Yo. So you guys started forming the band. What year were, were we talking about? The uh, business people start kind of getting things rolling. That's 2010. Yeah. yeah. 2010. Mm-hmm. Okay. So you've also, you start putting the band together 2010. Yeah. Was there a focus on, on original material from the start? Or were you guys thinking, hey, let's do this. Let's do some cover stuff. And then you started saying, let's write our own stuff. How'd that work out? We, uh, we started with a couple of covers just to fill out our first couple of sets. Okay. But I think from the beginning, there was definitely a focus on, hey, we have musical ideas we want to give to the world. And we kind of went in knowing that it was going to be a little bit of a hard climb to become a band with original music. But it's what we wanted to do, so we went after it. Yeah. And I mean, for years, like, between my band and in, in, uh, ninth grade, I was in with Will... And until we started the business people, I played in like a couple of like offshoot one off bands and stuff. Right. And did like open yeah. mic nights. And I had like, you know, a MySpace page with songs I wrote that weren't that good. MySpace, that thing brings everybody back. Ooh, yeah. yeah. If oh. somebody finds that page, <laughs> <laughs> it's still there. It's going in the archive of yeah. music when oh. you guys come out. I was in a, and I also in high school, I was in a technical death metal band. Nice. And, uh, <laughs> We, uh, I think that's actually, is, did you see me play? Yeah, it was at the first Barnstock. Tony was in Al Gore, Gore? but the Gore part was like a you do the scream yeah, thing. Yeah, that we can't Gore. do. Yeah, <laughs> Al, yeah, can't do it. <laughs> yeah, oh, it got, got kicked out of that band. That's actually, I think that was kind of an, a good impetus when Nick walked up to me and asked me if I could play drums. I had just gotten told that like, hey, don't come back to practice. You know, for reasons that I won't talk about here. <laughs> but uh, but the, uh, yeah, I was just like, yeah, you know what? Screw those guys. I'm right. going to be in a rock band. I, I'll be more metal than everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Devil yeah. horns up. Yeah. <laughs> you did play the first three years with the double bass pedal. So I did. Oh, nice, man. Yeah. It's <laughs> hard. That's hard stuff to do, dude. Yeah. Well, so you guys start getting together 2010. You start writing some original stuff. When is the first songs and recording come out i think actually that summer before we all went to college we went to we were in our friend's basement nick hennessy and he recorded like the first like i guess recordings we have it was like lonely tree and yeah. uh prolonged romance the first ones stuff. the first ones that exist but have never been released yeah yeah oh, that's really? right yeah, yeah. Okay. and yeah. then um i guess we came back from college we all just kind of transferred back to charlotte okay except for our basis so we didn't have a basis for a while and we did octopus which is also hidden from the world yeah that came out in 2012 and I mean, you don't really have to beat around the bush 2011 we we, we dropped out of college <laughs> <laughs> it was a long process of dropping out though <laughs> you know what everybody's got to do what they got to do you know yeah and yeah. you come to education or your job or, or what you want to do in your own good time i mean you can't judge everybody not everybody's got to go to school yeah, yeah exactly at least in my opinion and you know what learning is awesome and you don't really need teachers to learn yeah i don't yeah. know i've always been a big proponent of trying to know more than you did the day before yeah well, you know what i mean i'm not gonna harp on it too much but today it's a lot different i'm a little bit older than you guys yeah but when i was growing up like the information wasn't there. You had to go to the library and do it. Right. Mm -hmm. But today with the internet, you've got access to so much information. There's, you could find, let's say you want to play guitar. You could find guitar teachers at a couple of strokes on a keyboard. When I was a kid, you had to talk to your other guitar playing friends. Who are you studying with? Where are you studying with? What's going on? And you could find maybe one. Yeah. But I mean, the thing is, is that you can find almost anything you want. You want to research geography, you're going online, you know, and you can find yeah. out a whole a community of folks who are into geography to study. So it's it's real interesting. That yeah. is so interesting. I mean, that's how we've taught ourselves, like contract law, putting everything together, like because we definitely did not do our research when we were younger. And so yeah. we've got, you know, a couple bad contracts. And then we learned and now we taught ourselves, yeah, booking, management, contracts, royalties, how all of that stuff works. Yeah. BMI becoming unionized. Yeah. To, to any musicians in the audience, if you haven't done it yet, you really, really should um enroll with BMI or ASCAP. Somebody. They're the two big music unions in the US and they actually look after you and make sure that you're getting paid for your money. If it gets played on the radio or if you're playing out at a bar, they, they make sure you get your paychecks. Yeah, it's definitely something very important to, to know 
what you're doing because there is that business part to music. Yeah, there not is. just writing. It's, <laughs> yeah, how do I look over this so I don't get screwed? And <laughs> yeah, and it took yeah. us a long time to learn that. <laughs> yeah, right. Now we are not going to forget it. Sex, drugs, rock and roll, and contracts. Yes, yes. <laughs> very Wait, important. That's Mick Jagger. <laughs> Yeah. So when did the uh, first EP come out? That's is that uh, that's it. It came out in 2013. Well, that's it. Was technically our second one. Our first oh. EP was Octopus, and we kind of like that's the one that's down. lost to the world. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So Octopus was like 2010, 2011, 2012. I think it was 2011. <laughs> <laughs> no, 10, 11, 12. It, it, we released it in 2012. Yeah. Yeah. Well, how many tunes were on Octopus? Uh, five. It was another EP. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So did you? Does it not make the cut because you didn't think the tunes were as strong? Or was that you're you're kind of developing your songwriting? Octopus was, because I listened back to it recently, it was, I knew what I wanted to do, but I wasn't Mm -hmm. capable of it at the time. Mm -hmm. So we kind of took that back because we used Octopus to get into Converse Rubber Tracks. Right. And that's when we went up there and did that. Um, And so coming back to it, we got back from Converse and it was a great experience. Of course, we were like 20 in New York. So we got some mm-hmm. dude to buy us like 18 pack of beer and got too <laughs> drunk and we're hung over and it didn't come out the best. But I think that point, like once that happened and we saw that and we were like, Oh man, this isn't just like partying. This is right. serious. We came back to Charlotte. We wanted to start over from ground zero. So we did that and that's when we went in and recorded. That's it. And okay. completely just pulled it back together. Really got serious about it. Really practiced and worked on the craft. So what's the songwriting process like for you guys? It sounds like you're doing a lot of the writing, Nick. Is that? I do the skeleton. So I'll come with like lyrics, vocal melody maybe. Okay. And maybe like some guitar parts. And I'm just like, all right, guys, here's what I have. And then we just get into it together and we make it like a full thing. Yeah. From there together, the, the other three of us, we work with Nick and we'll do a little jamming. We'll do some editing. Hey, what if we put this part before that part? You know? And then from there, we make the proverbial meat and skin on top of the skeleton. So we have a full finished song. Okay. So it's, it's a, Nick's coming in with the basic stuff yeah. that he has the idea for. And then everybody else is kind of putting their ingredients into the soup to create the sound. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm the mirepoix, and you guys are the broth and the meats, <laughs> and the flavors and seasonings. I was gonna there say, I go. feel, I feel like you're the stock, and then we're the main ingredients, and together we pull together the spices. Boom. <laughs> yeah. So, so that's it. Comes out in 2013. Yeah. All right. How many songs are on that EP? That's five. five. World's quickest EP. <laughs> and did you guys record that locally in Charlotte? Yeah, we did. Actually, well, we need to even backtrack on that timeline there because um, the person that produced and engineered that, mm-hmm. uh, Mike Peppy, he's out in Hollywood Hills right now. But shout out to Mike Peppy if you're hearing this. And sleep I love blessed. you. And love you too, Joey. <laughs> uh, yeah, we had uh, we had a show. When one of our first shows in Charlotte was Snug Harbor. And that was one of Mike's friends from oh geez i lost it one of mike's friend mike's friends told him to come out and come see us and mike's a i love this guy fast talker we get off the stage he pulls us aside and goes hey guys you have a sound here we need to pursue this and we that kind of helped us keep yeah, going he we courted us for a year because we were like we we're like nah man we don't, we don't know what we want to do about recording right now. It sounds like it's going to be expensive. Like, we just want to play shows. And he's like, no, guys. So for a year, he just kept hitting us up. Really? Hitting us up to record. And, like, finally we were like, all right, you know what? Let's see. He's like, just let me come in. I'll do some demos. See what happens. Took us three days, right? Yeah. We cranked him out in three days. Yeah. Wow. He's well, actually the... the oh, sorry, oh, sorry. I was just going to say on that intro to What Do You Think? And mm-hmm. that's it. That's Mike talking. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Here's uh, the question I have is, were you going to a regular studio to record or with the advent of all the home studio stuff where you guys recording stuff at home? We were going to studios because yeah. Octopus was recorded in, I think it was like still. Matthews, Monroe. It's like still, still, water still water studios. Water studios. Yeah. yeah. Okay. With our friend Sam Shea, who um, he's now in LA and plays in Warbly Jets. But, you know, we were all friends in college just figuring it out. And mm-hmm. he was like, yeah, I'm interning here, but they'll let me record you. And, we cranked it out. Very cool. Yeah. And so then from there, that was Octopus Was It Still Waters with Sam Shea. And then that's it. We did with Mike Pepe at... Uh, Susu. Ah. Susu Studios. 
Is that still around? <laughs> Sue, yeah. Sue Studios. <laughs> wow. See, I don't even know all the studios in town because I'm kind of doing my stuff from home. So. Yeah. Oh, that's super cool. Yeah. Yeah, I'm trying to get there. Yeah, we're, we're working to, on it. I, I was talking to uh, the other month, Steve Stokels with the, with the Sponge Tones and yeah. Jamie and Steve. And Steve, if you listen to any of his stuff, it's all recorded at home. Like, And you listen to the quality, you're like, dang. That sounds like you recorded in a big studio, but they those guys know like their stuff around the, the yeah the studio. I did not record. know that. That's cool. Yeah, I don't know about the sponge tones. I'm just talking <laughs> this Jamie and Steve stuff. He, and and yeah. Steve's new group, uh, Pop Co Op. They do all that. Ooh. The guys are back and forth with files and stuff. It's actually kind of neat. That's really yeah. interesting. Yeah, you, I mean, all this stuff is like millions right of here. dollars. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you just have to figure it out. You know, which is which is the work if you have the time to put in. So. Yeah. All right. So you guys put out your first EP. That's it. Or your second, excuse me, second EP. <laughs> the, the, the second EP, the first EP that saw the light of day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. So the first one, what, what was the public reaction in Charlotte? Did you start getting some folks coming out to shows? How, how was that working? Actually, that's a funny story for that's it. When we were, um, we'd booked a new uh, East Coast tour okay. for that. And we were like, you know, kind of like low key about it, not right. talking about it. We had our release at Amos's and it was oddly on a Monday night and the owner was like, Hey guys, like this is probably a bad idea. You're not going to make money. Like we're going to lose money. It's going to not be good. And like 250 people showed up. Wow. That's we great. all of the money we needed to go on tour and we announced our tour that night right. and left the next day. Okay. I'm going to ask a stupid question cause I feel ignorant, but I'm sure. going to ask anyway. So you're booking a tour. You got an EP. Yep. That's seen the light of day, one that hasn't, yep. stuff that you're not really playing much. So how do you book a tour when you've got five or ten songs? What's what's that look like for you? Just out of curiosity. This well, is funny. You just um, this this hits on the business stuff we were talking about earlier. Well, you you just play all the songs on the EP that's seen the light of day. And the songs that are on the EP that haven't seen the light of day. Uh, okay. Right. <laughs> you just Yeah. And we made like a fake booking, uh, fake booking profile and a fake management group <laughs> to get. I mean, we got Mercury Lounge on that tour. Wow. Yeah, on a Saturday night. Yeah, yeah. It we was just, sorry, sorry, Mercury Lounge. If you want us to come back, we're better now. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are sounding good, man. All right, so you got the second EP out. You or, the, the first, first one seen yeah. in the light of day. Yeah. And now there's a a, a long wait until. The new one comes out from 2016. Yeah, Dirty Feelings. Yeah, why? Why a three year process in between? I mean, of course, life happens and things, but what happened? Woof. Ooh. All right. So uh, that New York tour, actually, we lost our bassist Jack at the time. Once we got back, mm -hmm. he went on to do school and other stuff, and we got a new bassist, uh, Baby Will. Shout out to Baby Will. <laughs> Sub Baby Will. <laughs> and you too, Jack. <laughs> but um so we had him with us for a while and then we lost him for a little bit too so we couldn't really keep a lineup together long enough to get into okay. the studio and do stuff <laughs> so and also during that time we did do some recordings they mm -hmm. just they didn't feel right it didn't work out to what we wanted we were playing around with the sound and trying to see like where we wanted to go with the music right and um dirty feelings actually that just kind of came together i had this really bad breakup and I had these songs I'd done that I was just kind of doing for myself. And they weren't like really full out, but From and See was actually the first one. And me and Will were at his house and sitting on his porch. And I played it for him like acoustic guitar. And he's like, wait a second. And I ran inside and got his guitar. And then we did this recording that's on YouTube. And um, from that, it just looked like there was a demand for these songs. And right. so we just started playing around with the idea of bass drum from NC and doing everything else to hmm. fill out the rest of the album. Oh, since we're talking about the song, let's go, let's go ahead and listen to that. Perfect. Yeah, cool. Oh, her name's not Savannah.
All right, so dude, I love that track. Uh, it's got a real '80s vibe, and Thank we you. were talking before we we started recording, and I told Nick <laughs> he reminds me of Billy Idol, his voice. <laughs> that that's that's so what I hear. That. Yeah, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so did you guys purposely start out to get this kind of '80s vibe, or what? Uh, honestly, I don't really think that's what it was. Um, it's just kind of I've gone through a. I've been lucky enough to be with a lot of producers that have helped me find my voice and okay. how to control it. And I think it's just an amalgamate of all of the different people that have kind of formed me vocally. Right. Is that the incorrect use of it, Tony? Is that what you're about to say? It's a, <laughs> it's, it's an amalgamation. Oh, okay. There we go. Hey, you were really close. <laughs> That's good for you. Good word. Good vernacular. All right. Well, there's that. <laughs> well, it's, it's, I mean, just as singing myself, and I didn't start till late in life. Yeah, I, it's. Uh, were you comfortable with your voice right away, or is no. it something that you got to grow into? Yeah, I. Uh, it took me a very long time to really understand and get my voice to where it needed to be. Mm-hmm. And um, I mean, a lot of people really helped me with it. Uh, I know the turning point for me vocally, like with my voice, mm-hmm. was. Uh, Jason Scavone sat me down one time and like who's that uh, Jason Scavone he was in Noises 10 okay and uh, he worked at CHP at the time we were doing some stuff there and he like sat me down at a piano and like just made me go note for note and he was just like do this or not do this not do this not do this and then suddenly I had a whole new range that I didn't know was there really yeah and so like I've had that happen a couple different times with a couple different producers and that all kind of led me to where I wanted to be and how I could get closer to what I wanted for okay. myself. So when you guys, when you, when you mention producers, yeah, do you guys hire folks to come and do the EPs with you? How, how does that work? Or do you have friends, friends quote unquote, <laughs> who, who are volunteering to come in and, and do some, do that work, do the production, be a producer for you? It's, it's a mix. Uh, yeah. Mainly, mainly we've hired people after becoming friends with them and th- just finding them through word of mouth. Right. Uh, yeah. You know, we'll have random musicians, random producers that are in the crowd, walk up after show and say, Hey, you heard of this guy? Talk to him. Or like in Mike Peppy's case, they'll walk up to us and say, Hey, you need to work with me. Like, trust me. Come on. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I mean, currently we're working with Joel Willis, uh, who runs the sound of visualite mm-hmm. and he's done really cool stuff in town with like flagship and other people. Mm-hmm. Misfits music, right? That's the yep. name of the company. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And he also did Liana's uh, new stuff. Okay. Liana Eden. And uh, Joel, we've known him, what, he's been re- doing our sound for like eight years. And I think just one day he's like, let me record you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so is he doing, he's sitting on both sides of the fence. He's engineering and yeah, producing. Exactly. Yeah. So what's, what's the guidance like when you're, when, when he's producing you? Honestly, it, I don't know. It feels like he's just another member of our band. Mm-hmm. I mean, anything that he says we were about to say yeah. for the most part. Pretty much. And he definitely introduces ideas in such a way that he's the sort of person that will introduce a, hey, that sounded great. What if we try this? Right. But then the way he does it, you know, we actually are okay with, yeah, you know what? Let's give it a shot. Let's see what it sounds like. And no one gets sensitive. <laughs> <laughs> I think that, you know what? That's just key for being a musician anyway. I mean, if you're in this industry yeah. in one yeah. form or another, you better have a thick skin. Oh, yeah. Because <laughs> you're going to get turned down or people are going to tell you you're awesome and then or not follow through with promises. And I mean, plenty of people get big heads and plenty of people go away with the tail between their legs because it didn't work out or they weren't making enough money or whatever. So, that's the truth. Yeah. You know, you better have a thick skin. All right. So next question. Raygun Superstar is in 2015. Yeah, yeah. Is that just a single you guys put out? Yeah. It, so, so you can. Yeah. It, it, it's a. It was a single that we put out in preparation for the EP. Uh, we had, we had an idea for an EP. And then at that time, uh, our producers had said, "Hey, like, let's work. Let's do something." So right. we at that point. Ray Gun had been the only fully fleshed out song, and also, we liked it the best. I guess is that the best way to put it? <laughs> we liked it. I think so. Yeah. I mean, also with Ray Gun, I think the big thing for that is it took us a year to record Ray Gun. It really did. Like right. it, it was ridiculous. took a lot of sessions because we were still trying to break out of that. That's it. Sound. 
Yeah. Because we're older. What, what do you mean the, that's it sound? It was more of the uh, party rock, strokes, garage rock, just, you gotcha. know, young kids. But we weren't, you know, young kids that just wanted to party anymore. We were adults. Yeah. We were in our mid-20s. We had, like, tons of life stuff going on. And we wanted to have something that really reflected our maturity. It was time to start being more honest. Yeah. You know, instead of the calculated hedonism of we're in a room for 45 minutes, let's all just dance and have fun because right. we all have our lives with crappy stuff in it. Let's just ignore that, which I think worked well for us. And it yeah. was fun. It was a good time. It was good for when it was. But then it was time to, I, I don't want to use the term grow up, but it, move <laughs> on. as as our tastes matured, we realized that we had deeper ideas that we wanted to give to the world, right. especially Nick. If you look at his lyricism, sorry, I'm talking about you in front of you, but <laughs> better be good. If you <laughs> if you look at the evolution of his lyricism through the years, you really start to see that. Oh yeah, exact idea of there's something deeper there that we want to get at. Well, you you start to get older and you mature as a songwriter, and the things that are coming out of you, I think, are going to be different. Yeah, and mm-hmm. even the way you know, if you're not the songwriter the way you approach your instrument you know you may not play the same way now that you did when you were 18 yeah oh very much so I I was I came in fresh as a metal drummer (laughs) now I've been doing pop format indie rock for nine years nine years now yeah yeah your drumming style has like changed like completely 180 it's really interesting to hear because I mean I've listened back to them all and just like you hear some of the stuff he's doing you're like oh man oh man oh man and then it just gets yeah really like pocket and tasteful you know, not that anything you did wasn't tasteful. It's just you were like, I don't mind playing just four on the floor right now. It'll be cool. It won't be typical, but it'll still be like right for the song. Yeah. I think we've grown as especially pulling Hyatt and, and now Connor is our newest member. He's okay. just been here for about a year now. Yeah. Having those guys with us also growing and growing together, we have learned to be less of a guitarist, a vocalist, guitarist, bassist, and drummer. Now we're thinking more like musicians. Yeah. Right. It's, it's a know. band and not a collective. Connor is listening to Nick's vocal melody to decide what his lead part should be. I'm listening to Hyatt. We're trying to figure out when we want our hits to be to complement Connor's guitar, Nick's yeah. vocals. And I yeah, start like, great. I've started stripping back my guitars to like, cause Hyatt is, a phenomenal bassist Mm -hmm. like he's a he's a lead bassist essentially so i mean essentially we switch roles and i hold down most of the rhythm and bass stuff and hyatt like takes those fills and with connor on top of it they just kind of do this weird accent where i'm just staying in the middle lane just going 20 hands at 10 and 2 there you go well it lets you focus on it lets you focus on your vocals which have just they're I we like, love each other. Yeah. <laughs> well, that'll become part of your, your your overall sound, if I'm not wrong. You yeah. know, you'll everybody starts to find their roles, and this is what I do, and this is this is how this works, and then all of a sudden you come up with something like Ray Gun uh, Superstar, and you're like, that's kind of where we're at. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Which means we need to take a listen to that tune now, too. Yes. All right. Hold on.
Man, that's another track I really like, guys. So we we already talked about how it took you a long time to get that. And it's preparation for for the oh, EP yeah. of of Dirty Feelings. What's the band doing now regionally? Are you touring? Are you staying local? What's what's happening? Uh, right now we're kind of basing down to local. We're trying to work on what we can do to help the Charlotte music scene. Right. Like our new mantra has been, you know, leave your scene better than you found it. Yeah. So we're trying to think of ways to bring us all together because, I mean, we know lots of bands and we're friends with lots of bands and musicians and creatives. Right. But we know them all separately and we want them all to know each other. Yeah. <laughs> so we're trying to figure out ways to do that. We're working on recording right now and really like getting the business side of the music that we never took the time to learn together i mean we don't have a website which is something we should have had whoops <laughs> well the, one of the nice ones things that's how i first heard about you guys is the crown town get down which was just all original local artists which i thought was fantastic so i got to see you guys and a whole bunch of other folks that day i was handing out cards like hey man i do a podcast hey man i do a podcast <laughs> you know it took me around a little while to get to everybody but nice. I, I it's a weird scene yeah. in charlotte we it's were talking really, about that earlier it is yeah. weird it's a uh, it's sleepy yeah but then people do show up for shows but yeah it's re- it's kind of like everybody has their own lane and they stay in it yeah 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 there's no there's no i don't think there's maybe correct me if i'm wrong nick but i don't think there's any casual fans really mm-hmm. yeah. you're either a fan or you stumbled into a bar to drink and there's a <laughs> band playing <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. like i told you before you know I'm, i play in uh, cover stuff yeah, yeah right. not to, i'm not part of the original scene but the cover stuff i'm not knocking anybody but people don't applaud yeah yeah and, and, it's and, a and weird kind of discuss that yeah. for, for you guys too yeah is that the experience you guys had too uh, unless it's snug harbor yes <laughs> <laughs> shout out to snug harbor <laughs> um why don't you talk about we had that evening muse show that was kind of weird last week yeah we were um so we were playing with little bird this band that's definitely they're really amazing they're but they're definitely not in the same rock pushing thing right. that we are they're like a very tight built band like they know how to control their swells get all that stuff going we're just more like, reggae influence dub influence still yeah, slower R&B, yeah. really okay. really killer players we're like a punch in the face and uh, not everybody was ready for that that night. So I mean, for, for them or for you guys? For, <laughs> for us. us. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, I mean, when we started out, like, there was just silence after the first two songs. And hmm. not even silence, like idle chatter. Yeah. You know. So were you guys opening for them or were they opening for you? We, we were, were opening. opening for them. So it was a real dichotomy. Yeah. All right. But then we did actually, it turned out that the crowd was receptive. And okay. you know, after three or four songs, they started feeling what we were putting out there, which was the punch in the face. And they were right. like, oh, cool. You know what? I'm down to get my face punched. Let's try this. And <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not like you guys are not playing metal. Yeah. You know, it's not like you're, you're some death metal band and, and you got the Cookie Monster vocals going on. <laughs> well, see, but so. here's, here's the thing, though, is... Evening Muse. Well, I got... They, they, I mean, I'm sure, like, yeah. it's not like they don't have rock shows and stuff, but for that bill, everyone that went there to see Little Bird, so they weren't expecting. Right. And on top of that, yeah. our, you know, to back it up a few years, when we cut our teeth originally, the only shows that would take us were metal, local metal bands. Really? Yeah. yeah. So in high school, especially in going into the first couple of years of college, uh, yeah, we we had to we were either opening for metal bands or mm-hmm. we were playing after the headlining metal band that metal kids showed up to see and had been moshing and being violent teenagers for. <laughs> and then we come on with our, you know, happy ass music. <laughs> <laughs> so we had to we actually um we learned how to have energy on stage and I think I'm proud of that. I Nick, yeah. do you agree? I think yeah. Our live presence. Do, yeah. I mean, what the venue was like an old renovated movie theater that we used to play in. Right. The bonus room. Bonus room. Yeah. Bonus five room. Well, that's <laughs> something you develop. I mean, I, that just takes doing a lot. Yeah. I remember when I was starting and I was playing locally here, I'd sit down and I'd play behind my chair and I'd sing and I had flip flops and, 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 Pant shorts on and then after a while i was like this is not what i should be doing <laughs> and then i'd stand up and i was like no man i don't care if it's 95 degrees on i gotta have my jeans on i gotta kind of like you know fit the part of what i'm doing and then yeah. you get into it yeah 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 exactly doesn't that feel great yeah 
Yeah, you develop a stage persona, if you if you will. Yeah, you exactly. Know, that's not that's and and I think that only comes about from playing live a lot. Yeah, you know? absolutely. If you're just coming out on the weekends and you're like, hey, I'll do this. I don't think mm-hmm. it really works. You're not going to do that. But if you're playing a lot, and I think you start to do that. Fully commit to the role. Yeah. That's, a, that's yeah. a good way to put it. I mean, I feel like my stage persona is more just like all of my day-to-day anxieties just coming out in one giant rage. <laughs> you know? I don't know. Is that just me? That's how I do my stage persona. <laughs> no, I feel it. I definitely feel like I dig into my guitar like the more it goes on. <laughs> I, I think it may, I've seen I it. mean it might be different for drummers because you guys are back there and you already have all this energy getting exuded. But I think when you're you're singing and playing and you got a guitar in your hands, you you have to have some movement and, and things that you do and, and yeah. to, to get that energy out. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. And you're right out in front. Drummers like smash, 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 smash. Look at this. Everything <laughs> I do already looks cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's it. Look, stick twirl. Can you do that? No. <laughs> For anyone listening right now, I, I am blushing. <laughs> <laughs> so what's what's going on with the Charlotte music scene? You guys are a little more in it the original scene than I am. So yeah. we've described it as a little bit sleepy. Mm-hmm. Um is there a lot of sense of community with the with the local with the local groups yeah actually there is like it's not necessarily saying that the musicians aren't great in the music scene because right I mean, oh yeah almost every musician i know is like friends with yeah, everyone right. charlotte is a very talented city oh my goodness and musicians support musicians right yeah. but that's the thing it's like it's a musician scene it's not like we have people coming in really as much okay. unless you're the big names right And so it's trying to find a way that we can all come together and get these people out here so that we can build like a self-sustaining scene, bring people here, bring labels here, bring business here for musicians. Hmm. And I think that's what Music Everywhere Charlotte is trying to do, but I'm not too sure. I haven't talked with them. Yeah, there's a few there's a few people with boots on the ground trying to. Yeah. Yeah. Because QC Nerve for sure, too. Yeah. Because like I said, the scene in as a whole is is sleepy from the outside. And then when you get in, you see how galvanized it can be. Right. There are circles and there are groups of bands and people and producers that have enough energy for you sit there and you go to a show and you go, you feel like you're in Manhattan or in LA, right. you know, it's, it's wild. Yeah. And I think that's, yeah, kind of a big part of what we've been trying to do is mm-hmm. how do we how get, do we f- how do we get more people to see that? Yeah. We want, Like, we have so many cool friends doing so many cool things and projects that we want everyone to see it. We want people to know about it because they should get supported. They shouldn't have to work day jobs. Right. They're talented. And, like, I guess that's what we're trying to figure out right now is how we can show our cool friends to everybody in town so they don't have to work anymore, so they can do more cool stuff. I think that's just (laughs) – I mean, that's part for the course, though, with being a musician at some point because, I mean – you trace things back in time. I mean, a lot of guys are, they're doing, or even they're, they're teaching, yeah. you know, they're teaching independent lessons. Uh, they're writing their own music. Um, they're out performing. So, I mean, I think as a musician, maybe just in today's society, yeah, you've got to have multiple income streams coming in. You can't oh, just yeah. be like, I'm going to sit and be a songwriter and that's all I'm going to do. And that's how I'm going to make my money. Cause you're going to starve. Oh yeah. yeah. If you're, oh, yeah. if you're brave enough, to decide to be a musician, you're definitely, you have to hustle. You can't, Oh God, yeah. you oh, can't yeah. not. Yeah. And that is, you know, yeah, it's always a hustle. Yeah. I'm, I mean, I, I know at least for me, I'm always sending out emails a couple of times a week trying mm-hmm. to find an, Oh, a new place opened up. Let me send them an email. See if they have live music. Exactly. Let me find, Oh, yep, yep. Where did you play? Oh, go to other musicians websites. Where are you playing? Hey, I haven't sent something there. Let me send something. Yeah. I mean, you got to. Exactly. You got to get in there. Like if you don't, there's somebody out there that's hustling harder than you yeah. and they're going to get that. The, the only problem is it's the wages of what people are getting are still like Ridiculous. wages from 20 years ago. So, yep. yeah. and, and that's, I mean, doing solo acoustic stuff for me is a little more lucrative. I can't imagine going in with a four or five piece band yeah. and being like, hey, can we play here? Yeah, we're going to pay you like uh, 250 And you're like, <laughs> all right, I'm going to go home with 50 bucks for the night. You yeah. know, after I, but you know, being a musician, you're just showing up an hour early to set up, doing your sound check, playing for whatever amount of time you got. Then you got breakdown, you got drive home. So whatever it is, 
however long you're playing, you're talking at least five hours out of your day. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So there should be better payment for the musicians, <laughs> like, which which goes back to what we were talking about. If we can somehow galvanize the Charlotte music scene to where more people are showing up more often and they're making money, then the venues will actually be able to pay more fairly as well. Because a lot of venue owners that we talk to want to pay musicians more. They they want that to be a thing. They want people to come back. They want people to not be, you know, starving and living on ramen noodles for years at a time. Yeah. But they're also local business owners. So like their overhead, I mean, they don't have a lot of wiggle room. They're, you know, this might be oversimplifying it, but they're they're kind of in it with us in a yeah. way. Yeah, they're definitely in it with us. Yeah, yeah. It's I, I think they're starting to be. A, a, at least maybe it's me dipping into this music scene more. I don't know, <laughs> but I'm starting to get a sense that there it, things are starting to slowly change, where people are starting to become more accepting of, of of original music here. Yeah, not that they don't want their covers because there's definitely oh yeah. If you take an older crowd, you know, f- people in their fifties and they're going out, yeah. um, and they're spending money when they go to a brewery, they might not want to hear the local you know young guys in the, in in their band. They want to hear. Their covers that this is the music I grew up with. That's what I want to hear somebody do. Yeah. Um, but as the city grows, it, hopefully the music scene starts to grow because there's going to be more musicians who move here. I mean, yeah. I mean, in the past six months, I think, well, actually, probably the past two months since we did the last Levine Children's Benefit show, mm-hmm. I've seen the crowd change like completely, like 180 overnight. It's mostly new people now that are at these shows, wow. which is. I don't understand when or how that happened. Mm-hmm. Not going to turn it down. No, not at all. But, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, it looks like there's a shift that's happening. Like, there's people that are looking for new stuff because, I mean, the young professional crowd is probably trying to find out why Plaza Midwood's so cool and they built a bunch of apartments there. <laughs> <laughs> and why are they so expensive? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and why do I get weird looks when I go to EB's? <laughs> yeah. yeah, people always forget. Don't get mad at the people moving in. Get mad at the developers. The people moving in, they don't know that they're living on top of where Tommy's pub used to be. They don't... He's holding that one close. I... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, man, I mean, I guess some people call it um, um, growth. Yeah. You know, yeah. the city's growing. It's... If you didn't have it, you wouldn't have all these musicians here and you have a sleep... You still have a sleepy little scene. Yep. Exactly. You know, and it'd be exactly. growing. But the other thing that's good is that as the city grows, more musicians move in hopefully more talented musicians. And then that gives everybody a kick in the pants to be like, Oh, I got to up my game now. Oh yes. We're in the middle of a really cool opportunity with all these people moving in. If we can just somehow maintain our culture, which that's a discussion for another day. If we, (laughs) but if we, but if we can somehow, yeah, get the thing going, get the new people coming in to see that there is a vibrant music scene that they should and can go to. Yeah. And then, incorporate the new musicians hear what they're doing yeah have this influx of ideas and just warm bodies to be honest yeah. i think i think you're right i think there's a really cool change coming down the line if if we play our cards right yeah definitely like a wake-up moment for all of us yeah well i'll tell you what i'm glad to have you guys on and have met you because uh i i one reason i do the podcast is to get to meet other local musicians and and uh, kind of expose them to to the community at large. So I'm real happy cool. you guys came on today. Hey, thank you Thanks so much for having us. What do you, before we go? What do you guys got coming up? The po- this podcast will come out in, in about April. Okay. okay. What, what do you guys got coming up for in 2019 for <laughs> business people? Whoa. There's going to be some really cool stuff. We aren't announcing it yet. Okay. Just May is going to be huge. Yeah. Right. And then looking forward, we were talking about finding ways to bring together all the musicians. Right. We're going to be doing something with that around June. Okay. Um. Probably in November, or actually probably sooner than that, maybe around September before it gets cold again, okay. we're going to try to do Rip Fest 2, which was the Rest in Paper Fest for QC Nerve. Awesome. Yeah. So there's going to be a lot of new stuff. There will be new music this year. Okay. There will probably be maybe music videos. <laughs> Ooh. Maybe. Maybe. I don't know. We will we... definitely have a website. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. All right. So where can we find out about you guys now? Because we're waiting on the website. Well, we're active on F- Facebook is if you want to reach out to us, see what we're up to. Facebook and Instagram are yeah. the two. We're sure. just at the business people. No spaces, no caps. Mm-hmm. Okay. I'll put a link to that in the show notes and, and to your Bandcamp page. And yeah. Check out the new stuff. 
Absolutely. Awesome. Well, thanks again, guys, and uh, much success to you guys in 2019. Hey, thank you thanks so, so much. much. Hey, come have a beer with us sometime. I will. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> See ya. And that will bring episode 18 of the Queen City Music Podcast to a close. If you are a musician or otherwise involved in the music scene here in our fair city and would like to be a guest on the QCMP, reach out to me at qcmusicpodcast at gmail.com. Remember, you can find the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and Google Play, among other places. So keep a lookout. Until next month, get out there and support your local music scene. Bye. (laughs) 